Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. How about this for a book title? A Gentleman's Guide to Manners, Sex, and Ruling the World. And, and a subtitle, How to Survive as a Man in the Age of Misandry and Do So with Grace. So I think uh, the number one thing we should figure out today is what in the world does the, the word misandry mean? We have our, de our guest today, Dr. Stephen Baskerville. We'll be right back. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I've just been stunned uh, lately by uh, what is going on in the Ukraine. I'm Ukrainian myself. My grandparents fled Stalin during the great starvation when he took the Ukrainians' wheat. And now we're seeing uh, uh, an example of, uh, of what men really are in the Ukraine today as the men uh, escort their wives, many, many millions, to the border and, uh, and then go back to fight. In this age when of, of gender confusion and, and uh, and uh, you know, a, a woman can be a man, and a man can be a woman. Uh, what can be more dramatically uh, expressed right now than to see men going back and fighting the good fight, and and being manly, and uh, and the women doing do, doing their courageous work of taking care of their children. We see images of them bravely smiling, uh, trying to encourage their children, while this horrible thing is going on all around them. So we admire the men and women of the Ukraine. But what better example? Of, of the difference between men and women and the women taking their role, their role to heart and caring for their children and the men going back to fight. And, uh, you know, it reminds me uh, of the, the kuleana that men have. Kuleana means uh, more than responsibility. It means more than stewardship. It's really an identify, identifying with what your, what your role is as a man. And I'm thinking, you know, in, with Adam and Eve, uh, God made Adam, and then He gave Adam Kuliana to 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 care for the to care for the earth, and then He made made Eve. But when when Eve fell, Adam wasn't there to fight for her. He didn't he didn't jump in between her, him and her and the and the and the devil. Uh, he didn't he didn't fight for her. She should have never been in a place where she could be tempted like that. Uh, he should have interrupted that scene right away. But instead, uh, she fell, and uh, and he fell. But who did God hold responsible for that? When he came into the garden, did he say, Eve, where are you? How did you let that snake beguile you? He said, Adam, where are you? The first question asked in the Old Testament is, has God not said? The second question is God coming to redeem, to save, to convict, you know, to, to, uh, to, uh, to rescue Adam and Eve from the fall. But he said, Adam, where are you? So it's, it's the men's kuleana. Uh, when we look at the world around us today and we see there seems to be this, this putting down of men, we're letting that happen. And how do we let it happen? By not being servant leaders, by not laying down our lives for our family. When we see the rise of women in the world, it's a wonderful thing to see women being more and more powerful. The rise of women doesn't need to be the fall of men, but we've acquiesced. And we've, and we've taken a back seat. We see um, so many men complain, oh, the women have taken over the church. Well, look in the mirror. Have you been teaching catechism class lately? You know, um, and, they, and, and in so many other areas of the world, it seems like men are just, are just being made to be jokes. But the reason why is because we've let that happen. And so we're challenging men to take on your kuleana. And what is your greatest kuleana? God said to, to, to uh, be a steward of the garden. Your greatest kuleana is to make a beautiful, big, large space for women and children to thrive. That's your role in life is to protect, to provide, to have a vision, to lay down your life. Not, not macho forcefulness. That's not the way God does. Remember, Saul was a Saul, the King Saul who fell from his place. He was a, he, he was a donkey herder. You know how stubborn they can be or stubborn as a mule. David was a shepherd. He led his flock. So men, God has put you in a role of leadership. 
There's just there's no two ways about it. But you need to lead by example and by laying down your lives. And like I've said at the outset, there's no greater example than I can think of right now what men need to look at and see the Ukrainian men stand up and fight for their families and for their country. We have Dr. Stephen Baskerville with us today. And I, I loved, you know, I very rarely have a, a guest back. Uh, but I just wanted to have you back, Stephen, because uh, I, I loved our conversation. Dr. Stephen Baskerville is the college, uh, is professor of pol politics at the Collegium Intermarium in Warsaw, Poland, and he's currently in Romania. Uh, welcome to our show, Dr. Uh, Baskerville. Thank you. It's good to be here again. Tell us just uh, for a moment, we don't usually do current events, but how's everything going there with you're so close to what's happening? Well, I was up near the Ukraine border a few days ago, and it was uh, there were a lot of uh, refugees there in the uh, in the bed and breakfast, the pensions, um, and we, we're getting quite a few of them here in Romania, and uh, of course in Poland, where I also work, uh, there's there's a huge number of refugees, so it's uh, you know it's very much uh, having an impact on people's daily lives here. Uh, but of course, you know nothing like uh, what, what the Ukrainians are going through and the, and the people who are still in Ukraine. What are you seeing there in terms of uh, of uh, the the outreach, the, the the love that's being shown towards them, and what 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 well, lessons can the we? The Romanians are very uh, you know very generous and very um, you know warm and opening. And the, you know people, I was up in a you know in a mountain region, and there was uh, the pensions were all open and, and serving them, uh, giving them accommodation and serving them meals for free without without charging. And uh, so it's uh, you know there's, there's been a great great deal of cooperation and it's very inspiring it's so beautiful um are you hearing uh anything about because um, we talk we talk here about about men you know the romania was very oppressed at the time under the soviet union i had a friend that had to escape from there you know and my my as i said my grandparents just got away from stalin you know before uh the, as the great starvation was taking place they know what it's like to live under oppression yeah very much so um many people here still remember uh communism uh you know, old, older people remember it quite well some of them still have the the um you know the memories of it uh, or at least as children so uh, you know people here are there's a there is a sometimes a sense of resignation when you when you live in a small country right next to a, a big country um yeah. there's a, a certain mentality develops of, of inevitability sometimes that this is just yeah. the way things are and many of the peoples that, uh, of eastern central europe uh you know have, have this have these, these habits that they've developed over centuries. It, it, and it's also worth mentioning, perhaps, uh, you know, in connection with the book, that communism was very hard, especially on men in some ways. It, it deprived men of their, of their natural role as providers and protectors because the state did everything. So, uh, you know, it, it, it really did deprive men uh, of their, uh, of their self-respect uh, to a large extent. So it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's very reminiscent. And and they see, um, you know, what's going on now. Of course, is Ukraine is not is not communist, of course, and Russia is not a communist country anymore. But there is this, you know, this understanding of you know what it's like to live with power, a powerful nation. And sometimes, you know, what I also hear a lot from people here in Eastern Europe, and who's been been heard for some time, is how communism or something reminiscent of communism is very much developing in the United States and in the Western world generally. And uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of people warning that um, you know we've been down we we in Eastern Europe have been down that path before, and that you uh, in the West, in, in the North America and Western Europe, uh, had better um, wake up. I think it's very interesting the way you made that statement. Uh, you know, America. Um, you know, you hear so often the comments, and I would say a lot from the younger generation. Uh, of how the state should just kind of take care of them, you know. What, why is why am I why am I not getting paid this? Why am I not uh, having this taken care of? This taken care of? And you're right. It's kind of an attack against their basic. You know, it's uh, it, it's like here. This is too heavy for me. Will you carry it for me? And we all kind of need to take take care of our own backpack. I've heard that said before. You know, we have our kuleana, and when instead we go look for someone else to help us. And of course, as 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 men, we need to. To help and as and, and as people to carry each other's burdens, but we shouldn't carry someone's burden who doesn't need the help. You know, he should be. It it it's. It, I I know there was a there's a certain types of dogs that love to carry backpacks. I forget what animal what dog that is, and they're so much happier when they are. And I know as a man, if I'm not carrying responsibility, I just don't feel right. 
I feel yucky. When I'm on vacation for more than a week, I'm like, this isn't right. I should be I should be serving, I should be doing, I should be working. You know, it's it's in the nature of men from the beginning, from the very moment God made man out of the mud, that he has he has kuleana, he has responsibility. And to give that away to someone else to be taken care of by the nanny state is the slippery slope to um to the breakdown of the family. We're going to talk more about that because one of the one of the things I really love about this book is it says uh, a gentleman's guide to manners, sex, and ruling the world. We're going to talk about what you mean by that. I think it, that'll be a really significant conversation. Uh, this is Bear Wozniak. We want to remind you that Sophia Institute Press has released my book, Deep Adventure: The Way of Heroic Virtue, and uh, also. Um, Surfing Guide to the Soul is coming out, I think, almost about the time this broadcast airs. So you can go to Amazon, you can go to Sophia Institute, or you can go to deepadventure.com to find out more. And A Gentleman's Guide to uh, Manor, Sex, and Ruling the World by Dr. Stephen Baskerville is at, you can get that at Sophia Institute Press also, and you can, of course, get it on Amazon. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. This is Daniel the Moon Markham with another episode of Country Up. Commitment. Was driving between Dallas and Houston recently, listening to talk radio show host Dennis Prager. Now there's one real smart dude. I don't often listen to the radio except when traveling by car or truck in order to help the time pass. In doing so, I try to find Mr. Prager whenever I can. Always get some serious learning from that old boy. Yesterday, he was asking his listeners if they thought being passionately in love was a prerequisite for a successful marriage. The conclusion was passionate love and marriage is helpful, and I might add a bit fun, too. But passion, he concluded, was not the determining factor for a happy and successful marriage. I was about to call or text in my comments to Mr. Prager when a lady called in and said what I was thinking and knowing to be true. A good marriage is spelled C-O-M-M-I-T-M-E-N-T. Feelings come and go, but commitment stays. Lots to be said for commitment. Like going through a season when your spouse is irritating the stuffing out of you or you're doing the same to your spouse. It's worth waiting it out. And commitment is what carries you through the waiting. Commitment means the other's more deserving than yourself. And that'll stoke a new fire in the future. Better stuff to come. Reminds me of what the old Apostle Paul said about love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He wrote, Love is patient. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered and keeps no record of wrongs. Seems as though the Apostle was sort of spelling out love as C-O-M-M-I-T-M-E-N-T. This is Daniel the Boone Markham at CountryUp.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven. Now you can journey with other men in the adventure of a lifetime, growing in manly virtue and servant leadership through Bears Man Cave non-Facebook community and our three-year school of manliness. Video, audio, and written content, as well as self-assessments help you to chart your new course. Join us at deepadventure.com. is a warning. The Bear Wozniak adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to invite the men to join Bear's Man Cave in our School of Manliness. It's uh, three-year uh, lessons uh, in the School of Manliness, but we go through it together as men. We have a Zoom meetup call once a month. All of us get together by Zoom meetup, and then once a month you get together with your small group by Zoom meetup. And uh, we go together through each through that through this three year cycle. So if you join today, you'd probably st be starting at about month eight of year one. We go through that together, and uh, 
you know, uh, so many men say, well, I don't know. I don't know if that if I'm holy enough to be a part of a group like this, or they might feel a little bit intimidated. We just say that we're all bozos on the same bus, that this is the cave of Adullam. It's the cave of misfits. And um, like in, in David's David's time, men who owed money or are running from the law. And that being in that cave of Adullam, God formed them. They formed each other into being the mighty men of valor. So the thing that I'm really encouraging the men to do, though, is several of the men who are part of the man cave and go and are part of the school of manliness they in turn you can get a membership for your son a free membership for your for your children uh your older son's probably 13 or 12 years or older and you can lead them through the curriculum they're not part of the zoom man cave community but you as a father have a way to lead them through the curriculum which is video and written um written uh, documents and homilies from the cowboy priest, Father Bryce Lundgren, and so many great things. And you can see as they're going through, they check it off as they go through it. And you can lead them through uh, maybe once a week, get together with them and do the curriculum. So fathers, this is a great way for you to help your sons to grow into manliness. And uh, so go to deepadventure.com and check it out. Dr. Stephen Baskerville, uh, your book, A Gentleman's Guide to Manners, Sex, and Ruling the World, uh, How to Survive as a Man in the Age of Misandry, and do so with grace. Okay, everyone wants to know, and this is why people think I'm smart because I have smart guests on my show. What does misandry mean? Misandry is a term that um, men have developed, especially men's rights groups and others, uh, as a response to the feminist term misogyny. Uh, and um, so it's, it's it, I dislike hatred of men, uh, you know, despising men the same way the feminists use it. It's a little ironic that I use that in the title because I don't like the idea of men and men's rights groups responding as the mirror image of feminists. Um, uh, so I, I, it's a little ironic to, to put it that way. Uh, but it, I, do, I, I do acknowledge that it works, that it, that it exists. There is such a thing today, as you, as you alluded to. It's, if there is a, a hatred or a contempt, at least, uh, of men and things masculine, toxic masculinity which is largely a, a response of, uh, to, the, to the, sorry, a product of the feminists. So, you know, the, the, they've kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of been a self-fulfilling, uh, um, you know, term. Um, so mm -hmm. it's, it's, I just use it in that way, but I don't think it's a good idea to dwell on that too much. We just acknowledge it exists and then we try to, to transcend it. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, going back to what I was saying earlier, you know, if, if you're feeling like you're cornered, and you're uh, and and uh, and you're being put down or can canceled. You, you let it happen. You know you have to. You know I interviewed someone last week whose whose book on um, uh, gender confusion. He's no longer on on a, no longer can sell it on Amazon and things like that. Just to have an open dialogue about that. But we can't just kind of kind of let that happen. We need to take our role as our role as men and and uh, and and I like I like this part. We say in ruling the world. Can well, I, I? That seems really bodacious. What I know, I know that has a, a, a very significant meaning to you. Can you? Can we dig into that? Or did you have something you want to say about misandry before we go on? Well, just about the about the you know, the misandry and the, and the idea of uh, you know men being victims of. Uh, uh, I, I think what you say is true. I think even when it's true that they are victims, even when they really are victims, and even when they really are being persecuted, I, I think there's some reality to this. It's, it's yes. not always men's. Uh, you know, it's not always their own doing, but the healthy attitude is to treat it as if it is your own doing. Right. And look, look first at, at, at the sin within. Look at what you can do about it. And that's the way, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, um, what's the term? Self-reliance, as Emerson said. Uh, you know, even if, even if you really are a victim, you, you can't play the role of that. Absolutely. Um, okay, so now you're, now, now, uh, now, you're now, the, now you're kind of provoking people when you say, in ruling the world. So, but I, but right. it's a, I, I love your book. It's a very specific uh, uh, view of what you're saying by that. Can you talk story about that? Yeah. I, again, I, I suppose I start off by saying what that what that doesn't mean because it is it is a little bit ironic. <laughs> yes. Uh, it does. As as one who studies politics for a living, I don't necessarily. I'm actually urging men to, in some ways, uh, to not put all of their uh, eggs in the basket of politics. That they're just taking up a, a political cause, a political ideology, joining a political party acting like the mirror image of the feminists is not really going to work. There's a place for that. There's a place for that. Uh, but um, men have to be self-reliant. They have to start with themselves. And uh, this is really what this book is an attempt to do, is, is, to, 
is to ask each, have each individual man ask himself, what can I do within the little domain that I have been given, that God has given me, you know, if you're not a religious believer that, that I've, you know, I've gotten in life. And how do you, and it may just be yourself. It may be your immediate family. Uh, it may be your community, your neighborhood, your workplace. Um, you don't have to change the whole world at once. You don't have to do, subscribe to a political ideology and try to impose your opinion or your views on the entire world. You have to accept the little sphere that God has given you and and take responsibility for that, first of all. And from there, uh, you know, work your way out. It may be that God gives you more responsibility uh, or you assume more, you know, circumstances give you more responsibility. Uh, and if that's the truth, then, then, then you take them on. Um, but as you know, for someone, for example, like Moses did, uh, he tried to wiggle out of it at first and, and God wasn't having it. Yeah. Um, so and as Adam did, uh, it wasn't my fault, God, it was the woman you gave me. It was her fault. <laughs> precisely, precisely. Blame someone else. Okay. So let's just get right to the heart of this. Um, this, it starts out with the most simple things. Um, uh, if you're living in your parents' basement, go get a job and get out. Number one. Uh, I would say, <laughs> um, clean your room, get up at the same time every day, get up at the correct, at, at, at a given time, a good healthy time every day, keep your room clean, uh, eat a healthy regimen, exercise, um, be, a, be a man who's a reader, you know, leaders are readers, uh, educate yourself, be an educated man, um, seek truth, um, spend your time in prayer. It's these little disciplines that are really the key. So first you take, you know, God gave Adam Kuliana over the garden. Take care of your garden, and when you do that, then God may give give bring something else. Like He brought He brought uh, Eve to Him. You know, God will give you more kuleana. But as a man, the secret to ruling the world, uh, according to this book that by Doctor Stephen Baskerville, a gentleman's guide to ruling to man or sex and ruling the world, the key is to rule your own world, the direct kuleana that God's given you. And uh, discipline, Stephen, it isn't uh, it isn't an onerous thing. Discipline, you know, of course, being a disciple, it kind of has the word discipline in it. The key to freedom isn't to do whatever you want to do. That's that is that what that does is paints you into a corner and entraps you. The key to freedom is discipline. It seems kind of ironic, doesn't it? But have a disciplined life every day to know when you're getting up. You start the day in prayer and study. You know what you know you're going to be eating a healthy regimen. It's an ascetic quality. You can learn a self mastery kind of from the outside in by how you take care of just your physical being, and uh, and 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 your and the kuleana right right there in your in your own home and in your own workplace, and then God will give you charge over greater things. And but when you're doing that, people can see that's a person of virtue. They're they're taking care of their stuff. When the time of need comes, you may be the one they come to and ask for prayer or for advice or for help. And that's how you begin to rule the world. You begin to influence others that way, by your life, by your example. Very much so, yes. And this is what I, you know, it might seem small. It might seem like, you know, you, you don't have much of a, of a domain at first. But as you say, it grows. And, and you also have the knowledge that if, you know, if you take on this attitude and these responsibilities, that other men will do the same. That influence, you know, the knowledge that other men are doing this, are, are adopting this, and uh, this is what I hope will happen: is that um, you know, men will understand that this is that this will become the the new ethic, or we will regain the old ethic uh, of what a man is supposed to be and a, a man's sense of responsibility. So it's um, you know, it's hopefully it's, it appeals to each individual, but I hope it also appeals to to men as a as a group. Right, and when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about responsibility and about what that what that means. Uh, if if people want to find your book, where can they get that, Stephen? Uh, they can get it on my website, stephenbaskerville.com, uh, Stephen with a PH, or they can get it on the Sophia Institute Press website, uh, which I'm sure they can find, uh, or you can get it on Amazon. Um, the Barnes & Noble site is not very uh, helpful, so I wouldn't recommend yeah. I, I really dig on this book. You know, it's it's just it's a really easy read. It's quite entertaining too, and it kind of has that sense of that old British sort of uh, of uh, gentlemanly. And but you actually address address all that what it means to be a gentleman. And I would just say, as in the words of John Wayne, you can't you got to be a man first before you can be a gentleman. We're talking with Dr. Stephen Baskerville. This is the Bear Wasik Adventure. We'll be right back with more.
Aloha, this is Bear Wozniak coming to you from my home in Waikiki Beach. Hey, you know what's really scary? Going to confession. You know, because you first went to the confession, at least I did when I was like, I don't know, seven years old. And I had to confess that I was playing underneath the pew when mass was going on. And I was such a horrible person and I was scared. And I never go to confession without being scared, but kind of an adrenaline rush, right? I always say going to confession is kind of like jumping out of an airplane. You know, you, 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 you go, you pack your chute, you're thinking like examine of conscience, you're examining your chute. What can I say? What do I need to ask, seek forgiveness for? And then I got to go talk to a priest in Persona Christi and say, I did this and I resolved not to do it again. And you're nervous. And then you go in and the priest just usually makes it so wonderful. And uh, you take that jump out of the airplane. Now I've been in the airplanes where people are super scared and they don't want to make that jump. Uh, but you know, they might have that look of great fear, but when you see them when they jump and you see the video of their jump, their, their faces just light up with a big smile. That's what it's like when you go to confession. All nervous, all scared, and you jump out, and then there's this great joy when the priest gives you absolution. Uh, it's almost like you feel after you've gone skydiving that you could conquer the world, that you can do anything. And to me, that's what it's like when I go to confession. You know, it's said that Pope St. John Paul II went to confession every day. Uh, so why aren't we going to confession at least once a month? Uh, and when you go to confession, I've talked to so many, especially men, who their return to the faith, their return to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ began when they went to confession. Eric Wardrum, the, the founder of the Catholic Motorcycle Ministry, has a powerful uh, testimony that when he went to confession, his whole life changed. Take advantage of the sacrament. This is Bear Wozniak, deepadventure.com. You can gain traction in the virtues in my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. And you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache, and triumph with my book, A Surfing Guide to the Soul, both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store, deepadventure.com and also on amazon.com. Good stuff happens when you support us at patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure. You get instant access to every radio show, Bear Wozniak Adventure, and our TV episodes, Long Ride Home, the instant we produce them, months before they even air. Plus, we give you all kinds of free stuff, coffee cups, t-shirts, and other things like that. Go to patreon.com forward slash Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure and become our patron. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that bell. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. Our guest today is Dr. Stephen Baskerville. He's one of the rare times that we have a returning guest because uh, we wanted to dig in deeper into our conversation about a gentleman's guide to manners, sex, and ruling the world. And uh, we got ruling the world kind of figured out now, right? We just talked about that for three minutes, so we got that figured out. But what about this area of sex? You know, um, John Paul II, the last word we talked about when we on our last segment was the word responsibility. And I remember St. Uh, Pope John Paul II, his first book was Love and Responsibility. How they go? How they go hand in hand? Can you talk to us about that whole area of the of the the role of men in in this area of sex and love and responsibility? Well, it's very complex. It's the largest part of the book. It's probably the one that's going to be the most controversial. But it starts with what you were saying a moment ago about self mastery, self reliance. It's you know as, as Milton said about Oliver Cromwell. It's a you know he 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 was able to conquer others because he first conquered himself. And that has to do with many things. I mean, you, you can't, uh, you know, it, it could be alcohol, drugs, um, you know, sloth, any of the seven deadly sins. But sex is one of the, is the big one in many ways that, you know, you, you need to conquer this, these drives and these, 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 uh, you know, these, these, these freedoms, if you like, uh, before you can be truly free. And all of the great leaders of history have, have pointed this out. Um, uh, you know, Frederick Douglass, uh, pointed this out in you know a dynamic in the in slave societies that you know the, the slaves that were able to, to 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 free other slaves like himself were those that were master of themselves and 
didn't succumb to alcoholism and, and other things with that. So it's it's a big part of it. It's also true that the, the bigger the bigger dimension of that all, of, of course, is the um, you know the role of, of men in relation to women generally, and the, the larger relations between the sexes. Now this has always been a part of the, you know of a gentleman's code of honor uh, is his relation with women. But that's the one that's really changed today. I think in some ways. Uh, you know, a lot of men, I, I, a lot of men that are physically courageous, they know how to stand up to other men, they know how to show courage and strength uh, with relation to other men, but they don't know how to do it always with women. Uh, and at the same time, be a, be a gentleman and honor women, but at the same time, it doesn't mean you have to take every uh, notion that pops into every woman's head. And it certainly doesn't mean that you have to accept every uh, tenet of the, uh, of the organized uh, political movements like, like feminism. And so that's the heart, that's what's new today. That's what's different about the, you know, the dilemma of men and manhood. And that's what I try to address in the book, because even though I believe that much of the traditional code of manhood and gentlemanliness is still valid, uh, I thought it had to be kind of reformulated, re restated in a new way um, to, to appeal to today's man, um, because the, 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 the threat to most, to manhood today doesn't come from the other men. It doesn't come from the bully on the block or the rival in love. It comes from the, uh, you know, the culture and this this political ideology, which uh, intimidates people, intimidates um, men, quite prominent men. Um, I've written several articles, actually, recently in Crisis Magazine and elsewhere, um, about how even conservative men who talk about manhood and regaining gentlemanliness, and the very men, many of the pundits who stand up and talk about the need to recover manhood, and yet they oftentimes are the most frightened of all when it comes to criticizing the, the, the movement of, of organized feminism. So it's, uh, it's, it's very, very pervasive, this, this chill, this diffidence, this fear that men have, and it runs through the church, and it runs through the universities, and the, and the media, and uh, everywhere. You know, it's interesting. Um, one of the thoughts that I have is, you know, it's just interesting. If you look back from our last segment about how communism and socialism becomes the, the dad of the family and the man is, is, is minimized and pushed out, read Pope Leo's uh, encyclical Rerum Novarum. If you want to really get an education, uh, he, he, yes. read, he read the playbook before the playbook was re even in place. You know, uh, uh, And if you look at, uh, at uh, Humane Vitae, Pope Paul, um, uh, about... Um, you know, when I was in, in the 60s, I was a child of the 60s. I was born, in, born uh, in the 50s, but really raised in the 60s. And I remember how, how I didn't, when a girl, our next door neighbor girl got pregnant, I go, how did that happen? She's not married. Because I didn't even know how babies were made. I was, there was a culture there of, of protecting children from even that knowledge. And uh, I remember my dad actually had to take me aside, I think just before I started junior high school and had a conversation with me. I was totally blown away. I was in shock. But now that type of uh, invasion into children's lives, they say the, the child at the age of three is the first time they encounter something where they may gain some knowledge in that area. And so, but I think that the timing of Humana Vitae about 20, 53 years ago was so powerful and, 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 and talking about, um, you know, um, um, I, I don't know how to say it, but not, ha not taking the pill and things like that, that that was, the, that was a path to destruction. And you can see, don't you think, Stephen, at that time in the 60s and 70s, when the women started taking the pill, it liberated them in a lot of ways. But on the other hand, it allowed men to take them for granted. Uh, the women no longer felt they needed to find a strong, powerful man who, if they were to become pregnant, would be would partner with them and, and raise the child. And uh, it just it, it gave men the chance to just like run wild. And I know Thomas Aquinas said the way you can identify a fem an effeminate man is is I'm kind of paraphrasing, is by how much he gives into pleasure. So in the 60s, men no longer had kuleana. They no longer, they could have sex without responsibility, and the women too. And so so at that point, that, that man who was having sex with all those women and uh, saying, aren't I cool because all these women are attracted to me and I can have my way with them, or whatever, whatever degrading way he spoke about women, that man became a boy. And men became boys, yeah. I think, at that time. Right, and I'm, I'm, I'm of the same generation that you are, and I, one of the points I make in the book, because uh, the book is really in some ways addressed to younger men, 
a little bit. And I, I say that, you know, we, we were paying for that. Uh, you know, it was a huge honey trap. We indulged in that. Uh, you know, our generation and the one before us really gradually developed. But the men today have to pay the cost for that in some ways, you know, because they, it, it wasn't free, all that free love, we called it. It wasn't free. Now it's turned into sexual uh, accusations, legal accusations of sexual harassment, sexual abuse, sexual this and sexual that. And uh, it's no longer, uh, you know, the costs come back to haunt us. Uh, there's, there's always a price to be paid. And, and we're paying it now. So what does a young man do today? How does he negotiate this? Um, one, one response of young men today is to withdraw altogether from women. Uh, there's this movement known as MGTOW, where men are a kind of de facto spontaneous strike against, uh, not against marriage, women, children, they're just withdrawing altogether from 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 uh, romantic and sexual relationships, and I I address that extensively in the book because I, on the one hand I understand it and it, in some ways it makes perfectly logical sense, and it's not it's a spontaneous development that uh, it doesn't do any good to rant against it. it doesn't do any good to scold these men and say that you're being little boys because they're reacting in some ways quite rationally, but I also argue that it, it, it's a temptation that has to be resisted. Um, because, uh, you know, we're put on this earth, whether you believe it's by God or by anyone else, and I don't assume that the reader is a Christian, but, uh, you know, we're put on this earth uh, to, 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 well, to, to reproduce our kind, to have uh, relations with the, op the opposite sex, to build a home, which is a human need, uh, which includes, you know, a, a spouse and, a, and, and children. Uh, and to replenish the earth, whether you want to believe it's because of what God told us in the Bible or whether you just believe it's our, our instincts, it's it's undeniable. And to withdraw from that, as some some people or some men are uh, are called to a life of celibacy, and that's fine. If you're doing a life of celibacy out of conviction, out of principle, uh, then that's one thing. But if you're doing out of fear, uh, then that's that's obviously not. You're giving into the enemy without even engaging. Yeah, and that's that's what I, I argue against. So I try not to scold. I try not to scold men for being for their failures uh, because their failures are, are in many ways I think quite uh, understandable. But I still insist that men have to rise above them, and not play the victim, um, and uh, and lead and, and be the leader and, and look you know look to themselves first for their own reliance and assume that other people have to look to them first for leadership. And if, if you're the one, if the ones, if the ones who are supposed to be leading are them, are playing the victim, even if they are the victim, okay. But if they're yeah. playing that role as victim, uh, then there's no one to look up to. There's no one for others, for children and women to look up to, and that's what they want to do. That's powerful, Doctor. We're talking with Doctor Stephen Baskerville, his book, A Gentleman's Guide to Manners, Sex, and Ruling the World: How to Survive as a Man in the Age of Misandry and Do So with Grace. Where can they find your book, Doctor Baskerville? Oh, they can find it on my website, along with my other books, uh, stephenbaskerville.com, Stephen with a PH, uh, or they can find it at the Sophie Institute Press site or uh, on Amazon, of course. It's written with a certain panache. That's a word you would probably use. I probably wouldn't, but you might just be able to use that word and get away with it, Dr. Baskerville. But it's it's entertaining, but it also drives, it drives home the point. We'll be right back with the Bear Wozniak Adventure and Dr. Stephen Baskerville. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to notredamefcu.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. We invite our mama bears to join our non-Facebook community created just for you, to share the journey with each other and to take the self-guided one-year course on the Virtues Plus. You have free access to all of the Long Ride Home TV show, all of the Bear Wozniak video version of our radio show, plus the Catechism in a Year videos, all at deepadventure.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to 
is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Fair Wasnick. Aloha, welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide. We want to invite you to go to our website, deepadventure.com. Uh, we have a full web store there, all kinds of, of, of really great T-shirts and, and, and journals and books. And, and my, uh, my book, uh, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue, is there. And my uh, new book that's coming out, I think, right now, um, A Surfing Guide to the Soul, is there. And so many, even actually one of my dad's books is there, too. He wrote a book on... Um, I forget what it's called about climb the highest mountain i think is what what the the name is and and so i republished his book for him so um yeah go to our website and men join uh bears man cave in the school of manliness and women uh there's a place for you there too we have the mama bears so go there and and uh, and check out our website we have dr stephen baskerville his book a gentleman's guide to manners sex and ruling the world how to survive as a man in the age of misandry and do so with grace Stephen, the the biggest uh, assault, one of the biggest assaults I see right now, is it's just it just I feel so sad when I'm watching a, a commercial. Uh, we've got we do you know, and and I see, or I'm walking through the airport and I see uh, uh, people with same sex relations just being displayed right on the TV or on in the in the print media, um, and I feel so bad for the little children. Um, they're being exposed to some, some to so much confusion right off the bat, and then we have um, and then we have this to- this total uh, attack uh, in the realm of pornography, um, which is which men who dwell who who men have to fight that, and to the extent that they fail that fight is to the extent that they 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 feel shame and they uh, fall inward on themselves and uh, and. Uh, and fall and fall into and, and they lose their manliness. How do we bat, How do we fight as individuals that battle? How do we win that battle? Well, uh, yeah, that's very difficult because it's it's again it's a, a kind of an addiction. It's kind of a, a form of, of slavery um, mm-hmm. to to succumb to these kind of uh, temptations and this kind of uh, pleasure. And uh, you know, I, I think you know again, uh, some of it is is the product of circumstances. I'm not. Men cannot make excuses. I mean, even when they're valid excuses, that, that you know that that the relations between men and women are so uh, tortured these days and so so disrupted that uh, you know there's a lot of perversions that come out of it. Uh, and one of the, I'm sure, pornography is probably one of them. So it's it's probably not surprising that it gets worse. Um, but still, it's it's not you know obviously it's not the solution. Now, obviously, homosexuality is not the solution. But that too has been in many cases you know. Uh, you know, there's very plausible explanations of homosexuality in terms of disrupted parental relationships, disrupted relationships with the father. Um, so, you know, we could we, we could all say if we wanted to that we're all victims of, of this, but it's, you know, it's, it's not the way a man responds. Um, so it, it, I, I think that, you know, we, we, again, we have to be careful about scolding, about pointing fingers, about moral superiority. And I try not to do that. It's not a, it's not gentlemanly. To, you know, you, you have to be grateful for, if you have a better position in life, you should be grateful to God and to those who make it possible for you to have that and not feel superior to those others. But at the same time, uh, you, know, you know, a gentleman, a man uh, should, um, doesn't tolerate, um, doesn't tolerate nonsense, doesn't tolerate, um, you know, sin, doesn't tolerate, uh, you know, perversions of this kind and has to, has to rise above it. So it's, um, it's something that I, uh, I do talk about that in the book. I try to give men, for example, healthy ideas about courtship on women. There's a, there's a lengthy section on, on, uh, on courtship, uh, how to honor women um, without, um, you know, without patronizing them and without letting them be, be the boss. Um, I think right. that's equally you know, part of it. Um, the tough guy, not only the tough guy like John Wayne, who just stands up to the bad guys, but also the tough guy like Humphrey Bogart, who stands up to the to the, to the women who are trying to. <laughs> it could be, yeah. We were we watched yeah. all the Humphrey Bo- Bogart movies and all the John Wayne movies during the Corona thing, and it was quite quite shocking sometimes. Bogart, <laughs> uh, but yeah. Yeah, I guess. But you know, the, the thing about it is, uh, I, I see um, when I when I see this all out uh, attack against 
uh, especially our younger people with that the pornography is just everywhere you have to win that battle you have to win that battle and it's a sin against yourself it, 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 there's a downward inward spiral into total decadence when you give way even one inch uh, to that battle and when when men join the man cave very often that's one of the first things they deal with is they, they want to be you know they want to you know, how do I get free from this and 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 we and uh, you know we pray the rosary and 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 things like that but but there there is that battle that battle for self mastery it has to it has to be won when we were uh, riding our motorcycles and long ride home and we came across uh, in Houston Texas and we with the Catholic Charismatic Center of Houston we went down to the brothels and we carried a cross, and we prayed the rosary and stopped in front of each brothel as we walked by. At one point, a, a woman opened up the door and peeked her head out, and she was so happy to hear us praying the rosary. She, there was this look on her face, and then you saw a hand grab her and pull her back in. And then the, the enforcers showed up in their Jeeps and stuff, uh, and uh, we didn't budge. We continued to pray and to move. But um, when you see the, when you realize that in every, every one of those uh, pictures that you watch there's a very sad broken person involved with that F first of all that should be reason enough but secondly um, it, it takes away it when you when you give in to passion you know I remember once someone introduced me to his wife this is Bear Wozniak he, he follows his passions and I go no I don't he goes yeah you're that guy you skydive you run with the bulls you do all this stuff uh, you, you follow your passions and I go no I don't um, I I seek to follow God's will uh, passions, you don't follow your passions anyway. They tend to drive you. And your job is to be the charioteer of those passions. But what I really want to do is stir up desire for God. The word desire means to look up at the sky. And so to follow that desire, that upward yearning, means I start the day off in prayer each day. Every, you know, st stop and I pray and I do my liturgy of the hour. I may be reading a little a good book by Dr. Stephen, Stephen Baskerville. Um, and I, and I, set my, I set myself up... Uh, to be girded with strength to face the day. If you don't start your day like that, you're probably gonna you're gonna you're gonna have you're gonna have a problem. And so, men, um, if you're if you're having that challenge, Matt Frad has has some really good uh, really good books out on that subject too. But uh, we got to fight the good fight and win that fight. And then when you do, I'm gonna just say it say it. On my wedding night, I was a virgin. Whatever happened to that? We need we need if I, I, there's a really good friend of mine here. In, uh, in Waikiki, who was recently married, has two beautiful children. He was a virgin on his wedding night at the age of 36 or 37. He waited a long time to find the right woman, but he waited. And so if, if you've yielded to that in the past and you're in a relationship now like that, go to your priest and get counseling. Um, maybe you live in the same uh, house as someone with someone that, that uh, you say you're going to marry someday. You need to live as brother and sisters. You know, sometimes you can't extricate yourself from a situation because there's children involved, but you can live sexually as brothers and sisters until everything get, gets put in order. Um, you need to, um, you need to f uh, be chased with that woman. When a woman sees that you're faithful to her before the marriage, uh, she knows that she, you'll be faithful to her after the marriage. And so I, it's time for you if you're, if you're involved. You know, so many people, uh, Stephen, I can go to an, uh, you know, and go to a... So many local churches, there's people now that are going to church and they're not married and, and they're receiving the Eucharist and it's like it's no big deal. But it is a big deal and it's har harmful to you and it's especially harmful for your children if they see you uh, see you like that because then they will go follow that same path. I'll give you the last thoughts now. we got a couple minutes left. Oh, well, um, uh, thank you for the... I, I noticed you, you, you picked up on the... Um, the the facetiousness of some of the book. I tried oh, yes. to make it a little less um, heavy. I've written two books uh, about the politics of uh, relations between men and women, the politics of sexuality today. And uh, people have complained that they were, um, well, not complained, but they, they've, they've told me that they're kind of heavy and difficult to, uh, emotionally, not, oh. not, not uh, difficult to understand but emotionally difficult to get through because the subject matter is so oh. in many ways quite depressing yeah so i tried to make this a book that's a little more again it's written in the second person not the third person so it's addressed to you and i tried to make it a little uh lighter a little more practical immediately uh facetious I, i'm glad you picked up on the jokes because there's a few of them in there and i, I, I you, do find it read, readable it's beautiful it's beautiful 
Um, and I got to say, I think uh, fathers who have sons that are coming of age, it might be a good book for you to read uh, read through with them. It's it's quite entertaining, honestly. <laughs> it is, but it's also you know it packs a punch. So where can they find your book, A Gentleman's Guide to Manners, Sex, uh, and Rule in the World? Is my I, I prefer my website, my own website, StephenBoskerville.com, uh, but also the Sophie Institute site. It's there. I believe they're having a sale at the moment, thirty percent off. Yeah, they are. They are. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, they asked me to mention that. Uh, or which you won't get on Amazon, but you can get it there as well. Yeah, that's it. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Uh, you can also go to my website, deepadventure.com, and find my books and, and join the man cave. Join the, uh, the mama bears. Uh, until next time, Stephen, we always give a shout out as we're leaving. Till next time, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. Hey man, I don't want you to miss out on your free stuff at deepadventure.com. Go there and subscribe to our weekly email newsletter. You get free video content, including the Bear Wozniak radio show, video version on YouTube before it even airs on EWTN. And you can follow us on all of our social media. Go to deepadventure.com and subscribe. Get your free stuff. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to press the subscribe button and ring that little bell. Don't miss out.